Hey guys, and welcome to another of the fourth advanced C++ tutorials. We are continuing our adventure into Lua C++ hybrid programs today. Um, so last time we saw the very basics of Lua. We saw um, variables, tables, and functions. If you recall, um, strings, and there, there's some little there's some little details we didn't get to go over like certain operators that we didn't learn about and nuances like closures and stuff that we haven't learned about but well, we've got what we need to use Lua um, in a very basic sense now let's um let's do a little bit more exploration of Lua before we do anything else uh, often in a project uh, one function one script won't handle it if if you start mo moving towards a direction where your Lua scripts are handling a great deal of um, a great deal of the computation, then you'll need to be able to include other functions into your other scripts into your uh, um, pro, uh, into your program. And the uh, of course the way we included the main is we loaded the file and called it. But that's not going to be a practical way to handle um, a lot of what we do moving forward. We want to be able to execute the main script and get what we need from the main script done. Now, um, using scripts, so there's a lot of different setups we can go with. We can go with scripts for configuration files, we can use scripts for uh, defining small bits of behavior, or we can use a script as the main portion of our program, our application, our game, whatever we're making, and the C becomes sort of the extension. In, in that sense. So we're going to explore all those different possibilities. But for now, what we definitely will need, no matter what, is a way to uh, basically the include keyword for um, Lua. In C++ we have include. We can include a header file into a program and that allows us to use things like STDCN without having to write out everything from this header inside of uh, this C++ file. Similarly, we can write require and um, requires a function that will take in a, a name, file of a name, name of a file, and then load and execute it. It also makes sure we never execute the same file twice, so we'll never accidentally have a situation where a certain library or file gets initiated twice. And um, it also handles things like searching for different directories, different formats, um, and whatnot. So we don't need to include a .dot lua or anything. We just need to put in um, the name of the script. So let's make a secondary script. Um, Lua tutorials secondary. Yep, this is the right place. Secondary dot Lua. Okay, so we can include perhaps um, some certain functionalities that we need available in Lua in this. So if our main is going to do whatever the program is going to do, maybe our secondary acts more like a library of functions. Let's, um, let's make a function that will uh, for example, let's make a function that will print the contents of a table. Print table t. Okay. Um, print table, by the way, the way I set this function up, the way I showed you last time was print table equals function t, like so. Um, this is just a shorthand for the thing above. It, that way you can set your functions up in a more familiar uh, programming, fun programming language type way. This really will just create a function object and set the print, varia print table variable to that function object. Now, let's... Um, we're going to have to use a for loop. And I did skip over all our control stru structures in the explanation, but um, for now, understanding how these are working is not as important. KV in pairs of T and print. And I'm sure you can imagine what this is actually doing. So um, if I do a for loop, um, I can do two types of for loops. The um, the uh, generic for loop, which is what I'm using now, uses this keyword in to basically loop through a certain thing. In this case, uh, the, sec the selection of things that I'm iterating through is the pairs in the table T. And each pair I'll get a key and a value. 
and then I'm going to print the key and the value, and that'll be it. That'll print a table out. So that's what our secondary will do. And by including by re including with the require function, we can we're guaranteed that it'll exist after that point. Now, um, if I tried to use it up here, it wouldn't make any sense because the Lewis state won't actually have the variable print table, sorry, the variable called print table won't actually be set yet up here. So I have to invoke everything using print table after I require that file. But let's just uh, print this table here. Um, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36. Whoops, we got ourselves an error. Hold on. Um, uh, I've got a, myself an error in the secondary file. Um, <laughs> yep, I accidentally put the word end there. It's supposed to be do. My bad. There we go. So now our print table is working. Okay. Now, um, the first thing we really need to do, now that we have the ability to use Lua as our sort of um, as a sort of extension to C++, is we want to be able to provide certain um, functionalities from C++ into Lua. This way, as we continue to use Lua more and more, anything that we can do in C++, we can also do in Lua. And that way, using Lua as a replacement for C++ will become more and more uh, possible. So, um, our basic uh, trick for um, calling a C function in Lua is to register it. There's a function called Lua register. Oh, Lua L. Register, I believe. Hold on, let me find it. Register, this is Lua register. I was right the first time. So the way this function works is you give it the state you give it um, the name of the function. So in this case, let's do um, squaring function. And you give it the, uh, the function itself. In this case, I'll just put in the word Lua square. Now, I have to make this into a function compatible with the format that Lua expects. In order to call a, a C function in Lua, it has to have the signature return of int and accept a Lua state as the parameter. So now, when I register this, um, this function here has been registered with the name square. So now the, inside the Lua state, there's a variable called square paired up with the, the C function Lua square. And um, this function can really do whatever it wants. I'm going to, of course, for sanity's sake, make it do what it suggests it will do. It's going to be a function for taking in a number, squaring it, and returning it. Um, the the way we can do this is uh, through the Lua state. The state will kind of uh, be our translator from what uh, parameters have been passed and what we return. So. Uh, first of all, we need to get our parameters. Our parameters in this case will be one number. So let's do float x equals Lua to number s1. Okay, so let's uh, explain what's going on here. The to number function is going to look at the stack in Lua. In Lua, there is a stack of a bunch of objects, and every time um, certain events are ca cause the stack to kind of um, refresh at one. So this is as soon as a C function is called, for example, a new C, a new stack for uh, inter interfacing with C is created. This isn't like our function call stack. There's a different stack for keeping track of calls to functions. This is our stack purely for um, operations in C. So uh, when we called this function, we called it with a parameter. Let's um, let's see what parameter we're calling it with. In this case, let's call it with square one, square two, square three, square four, 
square five and square six. Okay. So we're calling the square function with all these different parameters. So for example, let's look at this particular instance. When I, when this gets called, it's going to know that it's going to the Lua square function in C++, and the three will be pushed on the stack as the first element in the stack. So now, when I need to know what's the first argument being passed, I can convert it back into a number. I'm expecting a number, so Lua two number says the first element on a stack is a number, treat it as a number. If, for example, I pass a table where it's expecting a number, it'll return zero. Or if it's a nil, it won't cause an error, it'll just convert to zero. So, um, and if, it, if, if you aren't careful, you can cause yourself some errors, perhaps by passing the wrong arguments in Lua, or by converting to the wrong types in C++. So, Lua2 number uh, will take the first element off the stack. The stack, of course, is contained in the state, and the 1 specifies first element of the stack. So now, x should be 3 in this particular instance. It'll actually be 1 through 6, as you saw, every time it gets called. But we're talking about the instance where x is 3. Now, we want to return to Lua x squared, which um, we can obviously calculate by just doing x times x. But the question is, how do we get that to Lua? Surely we can't just say return x times x. Um, if we tried that, uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't return the number to Lua, and here's why. Um, imagine I wanted to return a string to Lua. How would I do that? I wouldn't be able to since my only return type is int. I can only return int. So the return has to have some sort of other format that I can return any type with. Actually, what the in number int is for, the return from this function, is to specify how many objects I actually am returning. Lua has an interesting property that a function can return and as many objects as it wants, or zero. It can return nothing at all. It can return one, two, three, as many elements as it wants to return. So what our return, what the return in the C language does, or in the C++ language, the C++ function is actually just telling the state, here's how many objects I'm returning in, my, in the Lua version. So when this gets called in Lua, here's how many, uh, function, how many objects I'm going to return. So, um, before we've told it we're returning one object. Now, we need to learn how is it actually going to be told, how is the state actually going to be told what object should be returned from that function. And the way we do that is with pushing objects onto the stack. If we push an object on top of the stack and then say, hey, I'm returning one object, it'll know, hey, the first object on that stack is the return, and the remaining elements are probably leftovers, and we can clear them. So, um, Lua push number is how we push a number onto the stack. We tell it what state to be pushing this onto, and we tell it what the number is, which will be x times x. And then we say, of course, like I was saying, hey, we've got one return, and so it'll look at the top of the stack and um, find that the number there is x times x. So if we run this, after I compile it again, we get, of course, the list of squares again. So, we have the ability to write a C++ function, or a C function, and then make it available in Lua. This is really useful because, for example, Lua might not be the best language to implement something like um, sprites, or a particle effect if you're doing a graphical application, or it might not be very ideal for um, handling 39DLL or some networking interface directly, but um, at the same time, Lua can be a lot, very powerful once you learn all some of the uh, complicated uses we haven't looked at yet. Lua can be a really great tool, so being able to have both would be great, and that's exactly what we get when uh, we do register our own C++ functions with Lua. This means that the Lua language can be expanded by C um, basically indefinitely. Anything you can imagine in C can now be done in, C, in Lua as well. Um, of course, we haven't looked at how to handle objects yet, and we haven't looked at um, calling Lua functions in C, which is other things we're going to want to be able to do. But uh, this is a great start. So next time we're going to look at um, more on how we can cr create objects in Lua or in C++, and then use those in Lua. Until then, see you guys next time.